Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Here again, I really do feel we happy few, we, we band of brothers. Um, thank you for, for being here. Um, in a way, I, I think we have one of the best qualified panels on a topic of this whole conference. So it is my great honor to, uh, to try to moderate this group um, on the issues of East Asia. Again, I'm Steve Erlanger. Um, I'm with the New York Times. And I do have an ancient history in um, Southeast Asia and China and Japan, and have tried to keep a real interest in it. Um, there are all kinds of issues that I think are obvious, from uh, China, Russia, North Korea, Hong Kong, um, and there's a lot to discuss. We have an hour, and I'm gonna try to reserve at least 15 minutes at the end, maybe 20, for your questions to this panel. And I think, you know, you can read about everyone if you like. I mean, this is all in, all in front of you. We're gonna go in order. And first, we're going to have Chiyuki Ao, who's a professor of international security at the University of Tokyo. Um, Chiyuki, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Okay. Okay. I'll just, yeah. Good. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your kind introduction. And I'm Chiyuki Aoi from University of Tokyo. I'm very happy to be here, very honored to be here. Um, Today, I'm included in this panel on East Asia, but my uh, academic expertise is on international security. Um, and it, therefore, I would like to include some more a global perspective to discuss East Asian uh, regional issues. So uh, my lecture, I mean, sorry, my, my, my um, talk is entitled Creation of a Rules-Based Order, Values and Contemporary Foreign Security Policy. And I would like to first say all views expressed here my my own academic independent opinion, and they do not represent my home institution, or although I had held the advisory position for the current Japanese administration in the Council on Security and Defense Capabilities, um, my views are my own. So today, I would like to stick to the uh, order to keep the uh, talk very short within seven, eight minutes. So I will discuss the following three issues. First issue is that generally, I would argue that most uh, uh, currently, uh, values play a very important role in foreign and defense policy. They always have, but I think for a number of reasons, it's more important today. And secondly, I would like to discuss some key features of the uh, ongoing current Japanese national defense program guideline um, and relationship, that, uh, re relationship uh, between that and Japan's values-driven strategy. And thirdly, I will address some of the challenges facing values-based uh, foreign and defense policy. Okay, uh, foreign policies have always been implicitly, explicitly linked to values, so there's nothing new in this. However, uh, interests, including national interests, have links to values. Values can be anything, and they do not necessarily have to be liberal, although we do uh, wind up talking about material national interest and liberal values. Values can be anything, I think. So uh, very often, foreign policy and defense policy are uh, really deeply entwined with uh, our values. Um, as mentioned throughout this conference, however, it is the current of a time that liberal ideals and values are intensely challenged from uh, within, from um, forces favoring populism and unilateralism as opposed to multilateralism, and also from outside, from entities that challenge fundamentally liberal ways of managing political relations. It is hence natural that the defense policies also have to come to involve defense of values. Because so much of our foreign defense policies have to do with the defense of values, there is a need to communicate, sorry, 
there is a need to communicate uh, well what these values are that what we are defending, hence the importance of strategic communications. It is particularly important to explain and justify our actions because particularly uh, actions started to involve a form of issue linkages, uh, such as the use of geoeconomics that go across traditional boundaries uh, of strategy, whether that is a preference or not. Very often communications replace physical force. They do so by manipulating or subverting the way physical force is perceived or the way calculations are made regarding escalation or disc escalation in military confrontations of how, as, as was so in Ukraine. Further, democracies are particularly affected by the advent of um, information and communication technologies. Uh, for example, the spread of social media, the availability of cyberspace, and globalization. Well, I hope you can see it. Um, okay, I think these features that I just mentioned provide for a very important background to the ongoing Japanese National Defense Program guideline. I was um, an advisor in the council that advised the revision of this document, and this document, in case you do not know, this is, a, a, for example, in the United Kingdom, it's the equivalent of strategic and defense review. Uh, this is the document, doctrine, uh, that justifies the use of defense budget, and in the case of Japan, it sits directly below a national security strategy, which was adopted back in 2013. So we re revised this at the, at the end of last year. So uh, I would like to highlight some of the key features, uh, only the, uh, the relevant ones uh, in my talk. So NGPD, uh, National Defense Program Guideline, uh, adopted a new multi-domain strategy that encompasses a new focus on cyber, space, and electromagnetics. And of course, these are going to be a game changer in the coming 10 years or so. Uh, so therefore, it's natural that this is included. But to my view, it is also important that it has the current program guidelines has redefined Japan's defense purpose, purpose to have specific streamlined links with particular defense activities, uh, which I argue will have implications for Japan's values-driven strategy. So uh, Japan has now three new defense purposes. Uh, first purpose is to create security environment. So that's, uh, that is desirable for Japan. Uh, and Japan will use a uh, whole of government capabilities to achieve this uh, goal. A second goal is to deter threats from reaching back to Japan. And the third goal is counter the threat and minimize damage in case deterrence fails. Um, these purposes are needless to say mutually reinforcing. And of these, the first category, the first purpose, the create category is new. Uh, the new uh, one justifies meaning, for example, to uh, Japanese self-defense force, that's a military self-defense force activities in uh, what are uh, essentially defense engagement activities, normally capacity building, defense diplomacy, peace operations, uh, whatever. Um, these before, uh, these are termed security cooperation in Japan. Uh, before, these activities surprisingly have no explicit link to Japanese defense purpose. Now they do have a proper home to belong. Um, what is important is that these, these create activities now can uh, reinforce Japan's values-driven strategy to uh, realize its foreign policy and defense goals. Japan's values-driven strategies have taken many forms in the last decade and a half, but currently the most important initiative is a free and open Indo-Pacific uh, FOIP. Among European powers, France and the UK are major partners in this initiative. In the region, in the Asian Pacific region, uh, Japan's ties with um, India, Australia, as well as the US are firmly established in this context, and all these partners are keen to develop mutual relations. And the new, I, I do believe that the region, new regional bloc called the Indo-Pacific is really on the rise. Um, but it should be noted that the uh, FOIP is originated by the Japanese, and following a decade and, and a half earlier, of values-driven initiative of, on art of freedom initiative. And so the origin of Japanese values-driven strategy predates the current preoccupation with China. The Japanese initiated FOIP approach is also different from a uh, more military and alliance-oriented uh, approach taken currently by the United States. Japan's FOIP 
comprise the principles of rules-based order, particularly in the maritime domain, sustainability and local ownership in ODA and investment. Okay, so my, I know my time is very limited, so let me jump to the discussion of challenges in lieu of conclusions. So to create rules-based order, to talk about it is, is rather abstract. So I think the major question that comes to everyone's mind is what rules and what uh, order are we really talking about? So um, we must, th that's the purpose, I think, the whole of values-based strategy. Uh, we must uh, together uh, with like-minded countries and with the local partners and others uh, to, to together define what these rules uh, may entail. For example, there are significant disagreements among great powers in the region regarding what those orders and rules are. And in bilateral relations within the region as well, there are significant policy discrepancies. For example, policy towards Southeast Asia, for example, among European and Japanese and Australian US powers, for example, always involved uh, tensions between the pursuit of values such as democracy, human rights, and so-called constructive engagement specifically bilateral policy among Western nations historically differed, for example, regarding Myanmar. And secondly, hence, there is a challenge of coordinating policy among so-called like-minded countries. Lack of engagement with each other among this grouping and with also local partners in carrying out various policies and projects are a continuous concern. FOIP in this context should be conceived as a main vehicle to get allies and partners on board uh, along the common path. So concrete projects must be jointly managed. Relations with key actors in the region must be coordinated. In this sense, FOIP is a very much a shaping activity. Uh, it's a multilateral activity by nature. Uh, lastly, uh, I think uh, I'm uh, personally concerned about the trend of regional realism, um, uh, which means that basically we don't have time to deal with issues that are belonging to that are concerns for other regions. For example, in Asia, are talking about North Korea, uh, the ascent of China as a superpower all the time, while neglecting issues and challenges facing Europe and vice versa. I think that's a very dangerous trend. I think we need to uh, talk to each other, share concerns, and uh, maybe perhaps together uh, jointly develop the notion of what is a rules-based order, because I think Europe and Japan are together in working on this notion. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot. Very well done. Thank, thank you, you very much. Um, thank you for that broad view. Um, and um, I think what we'll do now is go to Korea. Um, Kim Hong Kyun has been a diplomat for a very long time. He's now out of the game recently but um, has been the special representative for the Korean Peninsula Peace Dialogue, and I'm sure he has some interesting things to tell us about what's going on with Mr. Trump and Mr. Kim. Well, thank Please. you. Thank Please. you for our kind introduction. Uh, I thank uh, World Policy Conference for having me here today, and I thank the audience for staying late uh, to listen to, to our panel. Um, what well, there is nothing new under the sun says in the old Bible, but I see completely new uh, foreign policy trends being developed in and around the Korean Peninsula. First, the US president is directly dealing with the North Korean leader, including through face-to-face -face symmetry as well as beautiful love letters. <laughs> and second, South Korea is on the verge of divorcing with its closest neighbor country, Japan, with which we share common values, common security interests, and the ally. And third, the US-China rivalry expands from trade dispute into technological competition and now into security and, and military area. And it spills over to the Korean Peninsula. Let me elaborate a little bit further. First, on North Korean nuclear issue. U.S.-North Korea working level talks on denuclearization of North Korea finally resumed two weeks ago and quickly broke down without any, any, any outcome. Uh, 
since President Trump had a historic summit meeting with uh, Kim Jong-un of North Korea uh, last year in Singapore, there has been no meaningful progress in the process of denuclearization of North Korea. And there is no agreement on neither the definition of what denuclearization of North Korea is, neither on the roadmap to achieve the fully, uh, final fully verified denuclearization of North Korea. North Korea wants key sanctions against it fully relieved in exchange for the dismantlement of Yongbyon nuclear facilities, which is only a part of its huge nuclear weapons program, and it does not include its massive nuclear weapons arsenal. President Trump completely immersed himself in the re-election campaign, and he put North Korea as his biggest diplomatic achievement. President Trump wishes Kim Jong-un to be his loyal lover until the election day next year, but Kim Jong-un may think differently. He will think his star is finally brightening, and now he has the upper hand. So at a certain point between now and uh, uh, early next year, Kim Jong-un may threaten President Trump to resume an ICBM test unless President Trump agrees to a deal, a good deal for Kim Jong-un, but bad one for President Trump and for the world. Whether well, President Trump will succumb to, to this threat to save his re-election campaign or call Kim Jong-un a bluff by reintroducing fire and fury is anybody's guess. Either way, I think the goal of denuclearization of North Korea will vanish and North Korea will become a de facto nuclear weapon country. Second, South Korea-Japan relationship looks as bad. The relationship of two countries has always been bumpy to say the least, but it has never been this bad. In response to Japan's economic retaliation for a historic dispute, South Korean government terminated the military information sharing agreement with Japan called GISOMIA. And this brought about strong concern and deep disappointment on the part of the United States because the agreement is a symbol of the US, South Korea, Japan trilateral security cooperation and the United States made great effort to help conclude this agreement in 2016. For now, the chances for the amelioration of the relationship looks very dim. Prime Minister Abe seems determined to radically change the nature of Japan's relationship with South Korea once and for all. In South Korea, the emotion of the people and the nationalistic sentiment is so intense that it will be very difficult for President Moon Jae-in to find an easy solution. President Trump seems not care. He has no appetite to mediate between these two countries. In the meantime, China-Russia coordination regarding Korean Peninsula becomes even closer, and the US, South Korea, Japan trilateral capability to deter, to, to respond to North Korean nuclear and ballistic missile provocations becomes further weaker. Lastly, US-China rivalry causes new and old headaches to, to South Korea. US-China trade dispute negatively affects South Korea by reducing export, especially to China. US-China technological war puts South Korea in an awkward position between the two countries, as shown in the case of Huawei, in which US requested South Korean companies not to use 5G communication equipment by Huawei. If US-China rivalry further deteriorates and bifurcates global supply chain, South Korea could be in difficult position to take a side between the two. The US decision to withdraw from the intermediate nuclear forces 
treaty and decide to uh, deploy land-based intermediate range ballistic missile in Asia could pose a serious risk for South Korea if the US wants to put these missiles in the South Korean soil. So to conclude, new foreign policy trends are being developed in East Asia, especially surrounding Korean Peninsula. And I think South Korea needs both a well-thought strategy as well as uh, lots of luck to navigate this uncharted territory safe and sound. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kim, very, very much. Um, it, it brings one, obviously, to ask, you know, is the United States still a reliable, uh, not just partner, but mediator and, 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 and leader of its, of its alliances? And I, I think that's just part of the challenge that our next speaker, Douglas Paul, has. Uh, Doug is known to many of you, but he has been in and out of government, uh, Asia scholar, <coughs> now with the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Let's, let's, let's use the word peace. peace. Doug, please. It's always hopeful to talk about peace. Um, I've, there have been, at this wonderful conference, there have been lots of uh, valuable thoughts expressed, and I think that most of the things that uh, I know about have been well covered. Uh, I think people walk away from this conference uh, quite well informed. Kevin Rudd yesterday at lunch uh, presented the Chinese priorities in ways that I, with which I cannot quarrel. I think it was a uh, tour de force in you know, describing things in China. Um, as I begin my remarks today, I'd like to say, remind that Asia is far more diverse than Europe and other regions. Uh, we tend to forget that. We, if you're far away from Asia, you sort of lump it all together. But it's a very diverse region. Less disposed to coalitions than, than most. Um, for a long time, the United States in the post-war world managed relations in the Asia Pacific quite successfully, prosperity surge, peace reign for the most part, except in a couple of wars we were involved in. Um, and we used the method called hub and spokes, where the US was the hub and we had spoke relationships with the Republic of Korea, with Japan, with the Philippines, Thailand, and others. And we were the, the unifying force because they were not among themselves so unified. Well, you take that hub away, and then you get a lot of uh, units out there without spokes to bring them together. And my first observation today is on three broad trends in the region, is that the movement of US policy with respect to China, from engagement to containment, is eroding those spokes and, and making it difficult for the various countries, each of which have their own relations with China, to sustain the kind of tension that will come if they also try to remain close to the United States. There's uh, uh, trade policy is, uh, is an example of this. The US has not reconciled its trade policy between facilitating business opportunities within China, which would by definition deepen the connection between the two business communities and peoples, and uh, pursuing decoupling technological suppression, denial of high ac access to high technology parts, semiconductors and the like. Um, that both are being pursued. President Trump, on the one hand, seems to be looking for a, a quick gains on the trade front, but he's afraid to probe deeply into China for having fears of the defend, how to defend such an agreement against uh, opposition in the United States. And, but with below President Trump, there's a, a very broad consensus within the government to try to dismantle the many uh, ways in which we do cooperate with China for fear that China will overtake the US technologically, militarily, and economically in the decades ahead. Um, second observation, and this may draw some distinctions with uh, Professor Ai's uh, remarks. The administration of Donald Trump has articulated with the idea emerging originally from Japan of the free and open Indo-Pacific. Um, this is a direct descendant of President Obama's rebalance to Asia, which was articulated in 2011. I was a consultant on the original rebalance to Asia as an outside party, and I know well that it was designed to 
help President Obama draw down the expense and the forces of, uh, in Afghanistan and Iraq in order to shift the weight of American capability to counterbalance the rise of China. I think everyone in this room knows we never succeeded at that in that period. The, materially, you can point to a few technical changes in the American dispositions in the Asia Pacific, but in fact, whatever drawdowns have taken place in Southwest, uh, Southwest Asia, MENA, have not been transferred to East Asia. Nonetheless, China has been given a signal that the U.S. intended to contain China without the U.S. following up on it. I think the free and open Indo-Pacific so far is, is a matter of sloganeering internationally, which has similarly not produced a result. In fact, even under Donald Trump, we've doubled down, we now have forces back in Saudi Arabia that we had taken out a few years ago. Uh, the, the commitment to the, the, the Persian Gulf region remains quite strong, and new resources have not been made available to the Asia Pacific to provide the counterbalance to China's rise. Um, within the United States government, there has been some adjustment. It's kind of a symbolic kind of adjustment for the free and open Indo-Pacific. A few offices have been created, a few appointments have been made, but none of this translates back into capabilities in the region. And unfortunately, were we to try to go transfer some of these capabilities to the region, we would be stressing relations with alliance partners who, under pressure from China and in deep codependency with China economically, may be reluctant. A mention was just made by Ambassador Kim of the possibility of INF dispositions in the Asia Pacific. I think that's pretty remote, both in time and in principle, but it's a real concern that we may be asking countries to, to very small countries, very densely populated countries, to uh, position weapon systems uh, in their midst. This would be extremely controversial and difficult to achieve under the best of circumstances, and, and we know that China would work very hard to make it painful for anyone to accept them. As U.S. relative strength has declined uh, across the board with the rise of other powers, the, um, the U.S. has seen a shift in correlation of forces, and it's demanding more of the allies at a time when it can offer them less. Or in fact, it's demanding more in performance while demanding also more in support for the hosting of American forces in Korea, in Japan, and elsewhere. A, a third broad trend being reflected in Asia, I think, is the global balkanization, which has resulted from rapid, extensive globalization. And or people are pulling back from the, the forces of globalization, uh, even in the Asia Pacific, which has pr prospered tremendously from this. Japan and Korea, we've just talked a lot about this with Ambassador Kim, Japan and Korea are pulling apart. I, I'm increasingly of the mind that we're not going to be able to put this back together again someday. Uh, earlier panels discussed how uh, the choice for South Korea is particularly painful because of the very heavy economic reliance on China and the pressure China has put on them uh, with respect to defense measures taken to protect against missiles from North Korea. The um, uh, Myanmar which was a few years ago seen as a uh, emerging from dictatorship and becoming a, 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 an example of a rise of democracy in the region has gone into retreat. It's a, it's a very sad example. North Korea is about, I think, in agreement with Professor Kim, uh, North Korea is about to embark on provocations in order to press Washington back into talks and into concessions on the UN Security Council sanctions, which are strangling North Korea's industry. North Korea has made do on its commercial economy. It's getting by with some market reforms, but the state-owned enterprises are starved for resources that people are unemployed, and they're not able to act as a militarized state in their normal way, and they're very eager to get this back. Firing a few missiles and maybe even a nuclear test would be well within their interest to get the attention of, of President Trump before he enters the election year in January. In some, we've, the, the great irony is that the U.S., in dealing with a rising in China, needs its allies and friends more than ever. And yet we're making it harder for our friends and allies to work with us more than many, many years. And this is going to present a tremendous dilemma, not just for the uh, 
current uh, Obama, excuse me, the current Trump administration, but for whichever administration succeeds it. Thank you. Doug, thank you very, very much. Um, join in that. I come away with this image of this spinning bicycle wheel completely spinning apart with the spokes going in all directions. Um, China's watching this too. Um, and we have with us Xiao Yude, who is, you've heard earlier today, is um, an excellent thinker from Shanghai. Um, so what, what worries China, Mr. Chao? Um, Your turn. Okay. Uh, let me uh, go back to the, the topic of this session, uh, which is the new falling uh, policy trend in uh, East Asia. I, I'd like uh, first to share my, some observation in the uh, policy changing in mm -hmm. this uh, area. The, I guess a major changing is uh, U.S. Uh, adopt American first uh, policy in uh, two or three years ago. Uh, which more or less changing the political, diplomatical landscape of this region. First of all, uh, the, the U.S. defined China and Russia as a strategic competitor or adversary, uh, initiates trade war with China, uh, which I don't want to go detail, uh, have a, a wider impact on this region. Second, the U.S. Uh, exits the, from TPP immediately after Trump takes the office. Third, uh, Trump tried to resolve North Korea nuclear issue by establishing a personal relation with Jin Zheng Un, but so far not successful. Fourth, uh, push uh, Japan and South Korea in economic arena, including raising the payment for U.S. Army staying in these countries, uh, while, of course, U.S. still keep uh, alliance relationship with Japan and South Korea. Having said that, I want to emphasize the major pattern uh, in this region unchanging, which means U.S. still share the dominance in this region in terms of uh, uh, number of uh, airlines in terms of uh, military existence and business uh, uh, community. In, from Chinese perspective, uh, of course, the major focus in this area how is how to deal with a persistent U.S. Uh, challenge, uh, as I say in this morning. But interestingly, and I only, you can find in past two or three years, China actually now in the better position to have a good relation, better relation with other countries. For example, they improve relation with Japan, with South Korea, even with North Korea, of course, at the same time strengthen the relation with Russia. That's part of the reason is due to the pressure from US U.S. push China, also push other countries. Mm -hmm. So obviously, naturally, as I, in Chinese saying, they bundled together, warming up, to try to uh, deal with uh, further pressure from U.S., from uncertainty from U.S. Mm -hmm. That's the uh, kind of things uh, uh, China uh, is now uh, facing. Also, I guess China also try uh, very hard, uh, as uh, Kevin described uh, a lunch speech yesterday, try to keep a good relation uh, with neighboring uh, countries. Uh, funnily, I guess last year I met Martin Wolf uh, in Indonesia. He said, chat chat with me, he said, I'll give you three advice for China. First of all, play long. Second, have good relation with the neighboring countries. Third one, have good relation with uh, Europe. I guess uh, more or less China is taking this uh, direction. I stop here. Thank you, Mr. Chow. One thing, I mean, when we talk about, sorry. Yes, please, everyone. 
Um, when we talk about uh, new foreign policy trends, obviously one trend is Donald Trump and, and what he's done. Um, sort of, but another is the way his outreach to Kim Jong-un has changed the landscape. And I wonder if I could ask you first, but perhaps others, um, has Trump's outreach to Mr. Kim, has it been, it, you said it's not successful, but has it helped in China's eyes or has it made things worse? Uh, I, I guess maybe help China to improve the relation with North Korea. Uh, you <laughs> well, that that you, wasn't the idea. Yeah. <laughs> you, you may recall, it's unusually, uh, since Jin Zhen uh, took over the office, there's never top leader uh, visit between North Korea and China until maybe two years ago, until have this kind of things happen between Jin Zhen and, and, uh, and uh, uh, President uh, Trump. I guess uh, from perspective of North Korea, Jin Zheng and try to improve relations with China as a leverage, as a buffer to deal with with US. Sure. So that's, you know, you can see in maybe one and a half a year, they have a visit, uh, mutual have a three, maybe four time uh, yeah. meeting between Jin Zheng and Xi Jinping, yeah. either in China or in North Korea. Mm -hmm. Previously, three years ago, no any very cold relation uh, between North Korea and China. Do you, I mean, do you, do you think, uh, and then I won't focus on you all the time, but no, no I, mean, <laughs> I mean, do you think, I mean, is it your view, I mean, obviously you're speaking for yourself, um, is it your view that Kim would ever give up nuclear weapons? After all, partly they're meant as a deterrent against Beijing as well, one presumes. Uh, I, I don't think so. I guess North Korea set very high condition for them to give up. If U.S. meet them requirements, they may give up. Mm -hmm. But of course, the conditions they set are very high. Yes. Uh, not necessarily U.S. will accept that. Mm -hmm. Even they may ask a not necessary agreement between two governments. They want legislation passed by Congress. That's something maybe very hard for U.S. to do that. Right. That's something they learn lesson from other countries. <laughs> right. um, Mr. Kim, do you want to talk talk to that question? I mean. Has Mr. Trump made things better by bringing Mr. Kim in from the cold or uh, made it worse, do you think? Yes, uh, uh, I think the approach President Trump took to having a direct deal with the North Korean leader was not bad at all. Mm -hmm. Because in, in previous negotiations for the last 30 years, uh, we dealt with North Korea for denuclearization process and there was working level negotiation and once there's uh, agreement on the working level, it goes up to the minister level and then it goes to the leadership. And it never succeeded. So President Trump's approach, so-called top-down approach, is not bad at all. But I think the timing was very wrong. In, in 2016 and 2017, there was unprecedented provocation on the part of North Korea in nuclear explosion and the ballistic missile uh, launch. And there was strong sanctions regime was being built by international community by the end of 2017. So if the sanction could work for another year without ruining you know, too mm -hmm. early, then mm -hmm. I think the US must have been in a better position to have a good deal, good mm -hmm. negotiation with North Korea. But what I'm saying is that the timing was too early and that's why the, 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 there was no progress in the negotiation and we lost sanctions regime, which means we lost our leverage on North Korea. Right. President Trump is not known for his patience <laughs> and his long-term thinking. Um, but uh, Ms. Aoi, do, does, does Japan, looking at these developments, does it feel that the US is, is there for Japan in the same way? or does Japan begin to feel a bit nervous? Um, am I, am I, yes, uh, I think Japan has historically uh, had a dilemma of being uh, 
getting too much drawn into U.S. views or U.S. relations in global uh, mm -hmm. affairs and also getting abundant. Mm -hmm. So I think the basic trend uh, kind of continues, but I think the fear for getting abundant is, uh, I think, getting pronounced. Mm -hmm. Is, I mean, is, is Japan making outreaches in the region because of this? Um, I do not. Thank you. I just, it should work no, if you just uh, told it. It's on. It's on. Okay. Uh, I do, um, there's in, in part that, but I don't think that's a starting point. Japan has pursued very driven effort to reach out to a broader uh, group of partners, if not, you know, outright allies, but that ha I think has been a constant policy uh, in the last decade and a half. So mm -hmm. I don't think I don't. I don't think I would trace everything back to uh, the policies of President Trump, okay. although, of course, he has had a large impact on certain aspects. And then just, just to ask others, too, I mean, I mean, it's not brand new, but there is a kind of new Japanese nationalism um, under Mr. Abe. Um, there's been more money spent on the self-defense forces, which is, I think it's a word that, I guess it's in the Constitution, so, so that's what we have to call them but in the Japanese military and in the Japanese Navy. Do you think, I mean, is, is, is that making others in the region nervous given the past? I mean, I remember this terrible phrase of Lee Kuan Yew when, when Japan wanted to do, did do peacekeeping in Cambodia and Lee said, it's like giving liqueur chocolates to an alcoholic. It was not very uh, nice, but uh, was at the time very funny. That, that's very kind. I, I think that might be a, a question that's probably better answered by my colleagues. Okay. Yeah. But from my perspective, I don't think Japan has really gone over the right. board to, in, in, when it reversed the constitutional interpretation. And also it upgraded some of the activities that Japan, Japanese forces could do in uh, peace and stability contingencies. Um, those are... Uh, I would say very limited change. Mm -hmm. And I think there is a legitimate academic debate among experts whether this is something that puts a stamp on that, something that's already going on or whether mm -hmm. they, those actually represent a fundamental break mm -hmm. in our culture and right. actual policy. Right, right. Others, anyone? Doug, do you want to? Well, I, on, on the question, is Japan an unwelcome guest in the region? I think for all practical and pur practical purposes, Japan has passed that of, of being an unwelcome. But in Korea, it's a different case, as, right. we, as we've discussed just a moment ago. Um, and the, the uh, coincidence of Mr. Abe being in office and Trump taking a strong anti-China policy has pro probably brought Tokyo and Washington more closely together than in a long time. Mm -hmm. And where Trump sets a, a tone that the Japanese take comfort from because someone is standing up to their big rival in Asia, at the same time, Abe has been hyperactive in, re in regenerating Japanese diplomacy, so that there's Japanese competition for railway building in Indonesia and Thailand and India with China. There's a sense that Japan really is willing to put its money where its mouth is mm -hmm. under Mr. Abe. So it's been a, a pretty good coordination. All right. Mr. Kim. It, it is alarming to Korean people, um, especially if Prime Minister Abe would like to revise the constitution to, to fight a war then it would be quite alarming to, to, to South Korean people. And coupled with uh, other historical disputes, this uh, gives good excuse for the people who would like to bring about some anti-Japanese sentiment in yeah. Korea, to use them for the domestic purpose. Mm -hmm. So I guess that that's what, what happens now between Korea and, and Japan now. Yeah, and it's, true. it's gotten quite ugly, but we see this in Europe, too, I have to say, the um, same sort of po same sort of politics. Um, Mr. Chow, how does China look at Japan? I mean, do you do you see Japan as in as in the way? I I, I don't think so. Um, um, China feel you know um, uh, because a couple of years ago, the first time China GDP took over. Japan, that's maybe five, six years ago. Now it's almost double of uh, a number of GDP. So for some Chinese, they're a little bit overconfident 
in terms of dealing with Japan. Uh, but now I guess they keep a little bit cool down. Uh, they know uh, their weakness, I mean Chinese weakness. Although they have a large uh, GDP, because so many Chinese visit Japan, know their, uh, the, the, the manufacture is have a good quality, then better than in China. They, they under, most Chinese understand that. Mm -hmm. So now they have a more balanced attitude to Japan. Um, particularly in past two, uh, maybe two years, the relation between Japan and China get uh, improved. For example, recently, uh, the, 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 the 70th anniversary of uh, people's Rep uh, establishment of People's Republic mm -hmm. of China, uh, Premier Anpei make a contribution, also say some Chinese words. They get a very positive uh, response in China. Uh, probably next year, uh, um, the Xi Jinping will have a state visit to, uh, to, to Japan. Yeah. So, um, yes, in some way, there exists competition in terms of uh, making investments in Southeast Asia. But at the same time, they start to cooperate. They have uh, some agreement to targeting third country, make a jointly make investments in infrastructure. I think that's a good idea, good yeah. sign for coordination, not only just try to, uh, you win, you lose, such kind of thing. Yes. Doug, please. Kevin Rudd yesterday talked about how China has 14 neighbors that they have to deal with, <laughs> and none of them wants to be an ally of China. China has to deal with them all individually. Under the circumstances of high pressure relations with Washington, it's no surprise that Japan and China would start to improve relations. It suits Japanese purposes of other sure. nature. But for China, it's to break, the, uh, break out of isolation, mm -hmm. to make sure they're not fighting on all fronts at mm -hmm. one time. So it's an it, understandable phenomenon. It's a, a very good point, because I, I get a little tired of people in you know, Washington saying, oh, well, you know, we have allies, and China has no allies. Like, somehow China has no friends. But that's not really the point. China has countries that depend on China, whether they're allies or not. They're not exactly free-floating actors. Mm -hmm. So before I go to the audience, I have one maybe odd question, provocative question. Um, as Doug, you said, when presidents say words and don't back them up, it creates uncertainty um, and problems. Um, Xi Jinping has been very outspoken about China 2050, about lots of things. Um, so in a way, I just want to ask all of you, what do you think China really wants? I mean, what are the limits? Are there limits to what China wants? Um, or is this still unclear? Or should we take Xi's words as a kind of programmatic statement as opposed to an aspirational one? Um, Mr. Kim, do you want to tackle that? Okay. No, you don't want to deal with it. <laughs> Just to start the discussion, I expect I'd help to hear from Yi on this. The, um, Xi Jinping's practice has been to set big rhetorical targets and then in subsequent iterations sort of rein them in. Mm -hmm. He uh, went to the conference building uh, conference called Sika. Uh, the South Korean friends did a lot to save us from a a, a motion being passed by a lot of countries friendly to the U.S. that would have been highly critical of America. Uh, China was very ambitious of that. At the second iteration of that conference, they reined their ambitions in a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, another thing is the famous Belt and Road Initiative. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of rhetoric, tremendous amount of money went out on the first rush, and then people started to think again. There was some criticism externally, but a lot of criticism internally. Mm -hmm. And in this latest uh, summit of the Belt and Road Initiative, Xi Jinping says we have to stop painting with big brush strokes and start using Chinese <laughs> fine calligraphy, and, uh, which means rules, more control, and I, things do change. And so I think you shouldn't take every big programmatic statement at face value, much as you would not from most politicians in the West. Right, right, right. right. Um, Ms. Said, do you want to respond? Uh, yes. Um, 
Before I come to the question, I mean, uh, may I just take a little, what, just half a step back? Sure. I just wanted to um, emphasize that I can fully understand historical sensitivities in the region, but I think it would be actually wrong to interpret mm -hmm. the recent uh, change in constitutional interpretation as a sign that Japan will now go fight a war anywhere right. globally. And that goes for collective self-defense, and that goes for collective security too. Japan is not going to, you know, fight a war with you in the Middle East tomorrow. So, uh, you know, not uh, over expectations should be, not, not expectations should not be held too high on that ground either. So, uh, with that in note, I think China, what China wants, I think, can be, uh, my, my personal view, mm -hmm. uninformed view, is they can change, yes? I mean, it can transform as situations, conditions change. Chinese people look to me as very pragmatic. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mr. Chad, do you want to respond yeah. at all? Uh, yeah. I guess uh, the John in the sitting in the panel this morning, he uh, yesterday uh, to describe the fact, a very interesting fact is also today I chit chatted with him. He, he say uh, very interesting, only two major countries uh, never happened uh, in, in recent history, never happened uh, system collapsing, United States, and the Britain. But only in these two countries now populism prevail. Maybe 400 yeah. years ago is a so-called growing uh, uh, revolution. After that, the system almost yes. no fundamental change. Yeah. But what I try to say is a so-called national memory. I guess play some role in shaping the uh, future direction. Back to the topic you ask, mm -hmm. The Chinese government, or particularly top leaders, try uh, use this memory, national memory, as to say we don't, we want to take away uh, humiliation history in the past 100 years. Mm -hmm. Want China to be revenulate, become one large power, respected by the rest of the world. I yes. guess that's probably is, is the obvious the goal. Yes. But all, I would say in past two or three years, or maybe several years, in some way, a little bit overreach uh, in, in, in many ways. But you see, at the one hand, China claim it is still one largest eco uh, developing economy. At the same time, you spend so much uh, resource effort overseas. You should make a balance uh, between overseas effort and the domestic uh, yeah. Livelihood. Yeah. Uh, that that that's something, as a Dao point out, because Dao is a China expert to know. I have to say, in past one or two years, that's maybe positive side of Donald Trump pressure. Yes. The tone of Chinese leader has been soft, loud. They never say something. China move to the center of world uh, arena. Never say that, but. That's, I think, it's a good, uh, good sign for yes. China to keep uh, the modest in Chinese way. Yes, or, you know, I mean, to become, again, as Don suggested, a little more modest. Um, <laughs> but it, it's, it's, I mean, what it in, intrigues me is just, it's, it's, it's what you're saying. Also, China will not be backward again. I think that's part of it, right? I mean, um, I'm very struck by this. It's also, we had, you, you know, one of the great cliches now is decoupling, but it is really fascinating to see China developing its own internet, its own Amazon, its own Facebook, its own WeChat. I mean, and, and, and you know, even with social credit, just creating a Chinese world where the outside world exists, but it's, it's filtered, put it that way. I mean, that's the sort of most neutral way of, of putting it. And, and the result is going, I think, to be fascinating. I'm very eager to see what's going to happen, but I hope I don't say the wrong thing and get denied a train ticket. <laughs> anyway, let's, let's try to take a few questions. Um, Stu and then, and then the person behind you. And, ah, right, okay, so one, two, three. One area has surprisingly not been mentioned at all, and I'd like to start with you and get uh, your comments, and that is 
uh, China's decision to militarize coral reefs, creating really militarized uh, zones for your jet fighters, then under the <coughs> extended economic zone, claim, claiming your sovereignty extends hundreds of nautical miles beyond that, and then up with your airspace, ignoring a decision by the uh, court under the law of the sea that the Philippines brought. Uh, how do you justify that kind of provocation, and how, did you, how would you expect others to react? I mean, the U.S., I know I was on the Defense Policy Board. With Obama, we recommended, and he did, and Mr. Trump has continued it, to have our warships go by that to make it clear we believe it's international waters. So how do you justify this? It seems to me a highly provocative right. action. Could you pass the microphone right, right behind you? Yes, thank you. Yeah, Tatsumasa from Japan. I have a burning question to Aoi-san and Mr. Kim. Donald Trump allowed uh, North Korea to test short to mid-range missiles which are very difficult to even intercept by Aegis or uh, Pac-3. So exposing to the threat, increasingly neighbors like Japan and South Korea. The point is, is Japanese government taking some actions vis-a-vis -vis United States or just holding breath? <laughs> and same question to Mr. Kim about Korean government. Thank okay, you. great, thanks, and then this Gentleman in the front row, please. Thank you very much. Uh, Yoichi Suzuki from uh, Japan. Like Ambassador Kim, I spent many years in the Japanese diplomacy, not necessarily in the field of security. Uh, and like him, I uh, stepped aside on the sideline recently. Um, my intention is not to get into uh, some sort of debate with Ambassador Kim, but uh, I would make a few um, observations on bi uh, bilateral relationship. I would, uh, using his uh, expression, uh, qualify that uh, we're not on the edge of a uh, divorce, but uh, certainly our marriage had a bumpy <laughs> <laughs> stages. And uh, it's another bumpy sort of tense period, but uh, uh, I think there's a bit of a uh, difference in perception between Japan and Korea on this issue, and I think it's not that bad. But I would at the same time say that uh, in spite of a fairly close public sentiment, the relationship between our two leaders are quite difficult at this moment. And um, I think the point is that, as you said, Japan and South Korea to a large extent share common interests, and of course, I mean, even we can say we share, to a certain extent, common destiny because we are under the, the same threat. Um, in the past, I think uh, we, our two countries had the wisdom of somewhat even having a difficult relationship on historic issues, set this aside, somewhat separate this from the vital security issues. And this is, I think, exactly what the two leaders should be doing right now. Uh, okay. to identify the longer term interest, common interest for both of us and not sort of jeopardize uh, this uh, at the expense of uh, this, uh, what you qualify as, uh, as a, a retaliation. Right. What Thank we, you. we qualify as a normalizing the export control of some material used for semiconductor production because right, no, we know. suspect that these semiconductors produced in South Korea ends up in the hands of uh, people we not necessarily appreciate. All right, thank you very, very much. And, uh, um, yeah. So, Sorry. No, no, I, mean, I have a question. I have well, I mean, one question. So just say the question quickly then. Yeah. Um, some of you have referred to uh, Donald Trump uh, and Kim Jong-un talking as a positive move. But I think this move actually, as some of you have, have alluded, lifted somewhat the pressure on North Korea on sanctions. So ask the question. Yes, okay. so I'm saying, had Donald Trump not met Kim Jong-un and, and had this sort of easing of the sanction did not take place, would it have been more conducive to produce a better move, constructive move on the part of North Korea? Which is an excellent question, but thank you. So we are almost, we are basically out of time. So I'm gonna ask you to come down the row, 30 seconds, 
each. So, okay. choo -choo, short. Um, and just, so there was an actual question directed at you, Mr. Chow, so sure. why don't you? I, I'm respond. going to address the question regarding the island in South China Sea. Uh, it's a big contribution. I, I, I'm not expert in this area. But the basic fact is this island is not uh, some uh, territory of any uh, international recognized uh, uh, sovereignty land. It, they are distributed. It's not yeah. peninsula of Crimea. Okay, it's not part of that. So, from Chinese perspective, they regard these island belong to China, part of that. So obviously, from their perspective, they put some weapon for self-defense. I, I don't think it, it's a big deal. But you look at uh, which country occupy most number of island, not China, other country. But why U.S. only targeting China? Right. That, that's the country. Also, U.S. so far have not approve, Congress not rectifies the, the law, United Nations sea law. Mm -hmm. How have That's a true. legitimate reason to so strongly against China? That's something very strange for me. Okay, it's, it is something you and Mr. Eisenstadt might want to discuss more later, mm -hmm. but, let's, but let's go to Doug. Well, just to follow up on Stu's question, the, um, I've always assumed that China moved on the islands initially because other states that were claimants in the same area had similarly put some facilities, and China wanted to be sure it was left in the bargaining, not out of the bargaining. How it became so militarized is a separate question. Of course we were going to do freedom of navigation operations through that region with all parties. Um, when the Secretary of Defense asked me my advice, I said put in five comparable facilities at low cost with CBs on five Philippine-controlled islands nearby so that the military effect would be nullified, and then do n launch a diplomatic initiative by running constant freedom of navigation exercises. The issue of response in China is left to the military sector, not to the diplomatic sector. Foreign ministry is frozen out, the military gets to call the shots. That should not be in our interest. We want to get the diplomats involved. My proposal would have been start serious negotiations on fisheries agreements in that region. They're being rapidly depleted. Everybody's got an interest in conservation of those, those uh, fish resources, and we could put it in the hands of some neutral parties to take the lead, but it would be a diplomatic way of getting at this issue without militarizing it. Thank you. Mr. Kim. Uh, North Korea's uh, launch of short-range ballistic missile is a clear violation of UN Security Council resolution. But Korea government didn't uh, condemn such launch because President Trump said it was just small missiles. Uh, and I don't think uh, the, the President Trump met with uh, Kim Jong-un was wrong. As I said earlier, the timing was wrong. Right. There was strong international sanctions regime against North Korea. We should have allowed the time for these sanctions to take effect. Thank you. Ms. Aoi, last words. And, uh, yes, I think that the uh, most recent North Korean trials and errors with regard to short-range missiles and SLBM is certainly uh, provocative. And, uh, but I, I, my own view is that the deep set still deterrence still made on the Korea, Korean Peninsula, supported by superior conventional nuclear capabilities. Uh, you know, uh, antagonizing side um, might be uh, a little difficult to shake off. So I think that we all, all of these trials and errors will provide for maneuverability, certainly for the regime. I think that still deterrence stalemate, I think, will uh, stay for the time being. And it, I think it's very important also to think of, uh, you know, U.S.-Japan relations as needed, and also it's important to develop these relations. And I, don't, I, don't, I don't think it's nothing to be ashamed of. It's very important. And also at the same time, um, Japan needs to build, uh, you know, uh, rules-based relations with China, as well as developing, you know, partnerships broader than in the smaller region. So all these things matter. Those provide for a critical matrix. Great, thank you. So thank you to the panel. I wish we had more time. Um, and this also gives me an excuse or a pretext before I, to thank 
Thierry, the organizers, all of you, your patience, the incredible Song Nim. I, I, you know, I think all of us understand the work that goes into this meeting. So let's give them a round of applause too.